All right, good morning and welcome back to another Daily Devotional. Today's special guest on this Tuesday of Holy Week is Laura Johnson. Yay! Yay. Laura has picked our scripture for today and she is going to read it for us. Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. And I am reading to you from the Common English Bible Translation. Paul wrote, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed. But it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Look at your situation when you were called, brothers and sisters. By ordinary human standards, not many were wise, not many were powerful, not many were from the upper class. But God chose what the world considers foolish to shame the wise. God chose what the world considers weak to shame the strong. And God chose what the world considers low class and low life, what is considered to be nothing, to reduce what is considered to be something to nothing. So no human being can brag in God's presence. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. He became wisdom from God for us. This means that he made us righteous and holy and he delivered us. This is consistent with what was written. The one who brags should brag in the Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. All right. Um, I forgot one before we get too serious. I forgot one piece of like humorous uh, detail. Uh, and that is if you've been watching with us the last couple of uh, days, you notice that we've talked a lot about King's Hawaiian bread and Ellen Rose uh, sent each of us a pack of. <laughs> Thanks Ellen. Thank you Ellen. <laughs> the greatest surprise of my week. And thank you Costco for this. Charmous <laughs> So I would just like to further reiterate that King's Hawaiian bread is the best communion bread and Laura's got the giant size. So if you see us eating King's Hawaiian bread, that may be why. Anyway, moving back to more serious things of scripture, um, what stood out to you as you were reading through this passage? So I think what thinking about this week, it being Holy Week and all, <clears throat> of the week that we remember Jesus's death and how it, we proclaim that his death was his victory and how foolish that sounds. Um, and so it's just a reminder of, to me, it's just a reminder that it's, it can seem so rote to us. Like how many good Fridays have we lived? Right. But it's, I feel like this is an invitation to try and look at it from fresh, fresh eyes and say, wow, like God became a human and died for us. And we proclaim that to be our victory. The foolishness definitely sticks out. Um, I remember that uh, one time, I don't know. We were sitting around the office and it was like, I think Dana, Dana, you were there. It was like you, me, Corey, and like Angelo. Yep. And, and Angelo noted how the two days of the year where the most people are in church are the two days where like the most odd thing happens within the faith story. And that is that God comes down uh, and decides to live among us. And then that, God dies and raises himself from the dead after three days. And like, those are the two days that everybody gets on board and shows up to church. It's the rest of the time when we talk about, Oh, you should love your neighbor and, you know, take care of the less fortunate around you. Like that, I guess that's not like fanciful enough for people to show up. But like the two days that we preach the hardest things, the most foolish things, those are the days that people show up to see and to hear. 
It's just really interesting. I like um, that. It, it reminds me of something my mom would say or my dad, you know, that don't get too big for your britches. Um, it's such a good reminder that like, don't be so sure of yourself and, and think that you've got this all figured out, that this whole thing is foolish to us. Um, and also that we can't do any of this without God. Like none of it hinges on us. It all hinges on God. And uh, it's just kind of a good reminder to, to uh, take a step back and, and humble yourself. Have you guys ever considered how you uh, most readily identify with God? Like we have all these different adjectives and superlatives that are used to describe God, all these different ways, these attributes that we talk about, about the roles that God uh, plays within all of creation. And it's one of the things that we talk about at confirmation. And one of the ways that I most readily identify with God is God as teacher. And I don't know if that's because I don't know if it's like a chicken or the, the egg kind of thing of, did I go to school to study religion because I identified God as teacher or do I identify God as teacher because I went to school and learned a lot. Um, but like that is kind of like sitting in the back of my brain as I then read, um, verse 19, which comes out of Isaiah and it's, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. And I think of like how much I try to like rationally put God in a box or like, or like have an answer for everything that I encounter within scripture and like try to be extremely rational and logical about this like foolish thing of God coming and living among us and then dying and raising after three days. Um, and it's kind of, that stood out to me because it's kind of making me like pause and reflect on like, do I allow for a mystery of God to still exist within my own faith life? Or do I, am I constantly trying to put God into a box that I can describe and define and write a paper about and like argue about? Um, and am I, am I allowing space for God to still show up in unexpected and surprising ways in foolish ways? Yeah, there's a big freedom I find when I take that step back and say, there's no way I'm going to figure everything else, everything out about God. And I I mean, it lets the imaginative part of my brain just kind of relax and, and be like, just kind of trying to think through God is bigger than my pea-sized brain can ever comprehend. And there's a freedom in that. And I think of, I don't, if y'all have read like the C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia series, the last book, I don't remember what it's called, but what I remember of it is um, they end up in like a heaven where they're with God or with um, Aslan, right? And it's all, they're always going onward and upward. They're always going deeper and deeper into the mystery of who God is. And there's never like an end in sight. Like there's always more about God there is to learn. Um, and God's wisdom and God's personhood are so much bigger than we can imagine that it feels like foolishness to us. I think it was like the second video that we did, I talked about Greek Orthodox icons and how there's a lot of, um, like there's a story behind all the icons and how uh, there's some where it depicts Jesus and he is surrounded all in all in like gold to show his holiness. But as the closer that you get to the image of God and Christ, it gets darker because it's all of that mystery. And it's like supposed to be that mystery of like the closer that you get to God and Jesus, it's going to be darker and darker. That's deep, Aaron. Thank you. I try. Um, I think Augustine did it too. Um, sorry, Marcus is dead glaring me. I'm sorry. Augustine talks about this ladder of knowledge and wisdom and how um, you have to be willing to give up the knowledge that you have of this entire material world in order to start gaining knowledge about God. And you have to be willing to give up all of the knowledge that you're bragging about to gain more knowledge. This feels very like, um, like Socrates, the whole, you know, the more I learn, the less I realize I know. Mm -hmm. And like the, the more and more we try to pursue God and know God is it the more that we like figure out how little we actually realize and know? So it's like life. The more we think we're going to have it figured out as we 
become an older parent or an older person, the more we realize we don't know, right? Some of us are just faking it to make it. Like just, just, <laughs> just keep on trucking on. Okay. Um, how much are you, so there's a there's a thing that we learned about in divinity school called like stages of faith. How much credence do you guys give to that, Aaron and Laura? Are you guys familiar with with that that work? I think it was Fowler that wrote about it. Caroline Fowler. Mm, uh, I think James. James Fowler. No, I'm not very familiar with that. At least it's not popping into my brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so James Fowler talks about um, these like different stages of faith, and it's and it's an extreme oversimplification, and it really takes faith and like puts it on a 2D plane rather than understand like there's different ways, there's different areas of our faith that we grow in at different rates and all that. But, um, and he kind of talks about how when you start out, you have like a very like, um much like a child, you have like a concrete understanding of very like black and white lines drawn very like literal. Um, it calls a uh, stage two is called like mythic literalism and everything has to be like very concrete. But as you move like deeper and deeper in, in uh, the stages of faith, the more um, ambiguous things become and the more like nuanced there is to things and the more comfortable you are with like, this this idea of like wrestling um again it's like it's like an over it's a super oversimplification of faith process and development but that's kind of also what's what's coming to mind is like as we're kind of reflecting on this foolishness of faith like as we grow closer and closer to god do we actually become more and more comfortable with a level of unknown still existing out there yes this week's divinity school lessons brought to you by marcus i'm using all all the all the recesses of my brain to pull that out. Of. <laughs> um, what questions stood out to you guys as you were reading through this passage? I kind of wonder how this was received by people, um, because you know he's talking about all of the all of the foolishness, and he's like he's calling out Jews who are looking for signs, and Greek who are looking they're looking for human wisdom, and um, and the Gentiles uh, who say it's all nonsense and. I, I just, I wonder how this went over, and, you know, like kind of painting did, himself into a corner where he has no friends among him. Right. Let me yeah. just insult everyone. I'm an equal opportunist. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, I mean, we know he's not, he wasn't scared of doing that, but, but I just, I kind of wonder like, yeah, what the reaction was. Did they hear it and take it to heart? Did they get mad? Was it a mixture of both? And I'm just trying to think of like, if, if we really preached this today, like would people squirm? Like if, if, if you, if you preached a sermon that was all of this about how foolish we all are and how I just, yeah. How would, how would people receive it today to, to, to be called foolish or to be reminded that what we believe looks foolish and you're looking for the wrong things and just interesting. I think there's a real tension that exists out there of like, what, what can you say to a congregation or, or to fellow believers? And it's the, it's the whole like grace and grace part of grace and truth. Like how can you say it in such a graceful way that people still hear it? And it, and it sits with them rather than just being like an, an insult to them or, or angering them or, or having them turn off whatever it is that you're saying. And when I read Paul, like especially Galatians, like I don't read a grace and truth, Paul. Like I find that Paul tends to be a little more blunt. Um, and so I think it's always a question of like what that, how do you strike that balance of, of that? But yeah, it's interesting to me that he he make like he makes foolishness seem like such a virtue. Um. And I, and I kind of like along Dana's lines, like I wonder who that appeals to because nobody wants to be called foolish. Um, and yet maybe that's his point is he's like trying to like confound our understanding of what is virtuous so that we can think through, we can, we can look from God's perspective differently. I don't, I don't know. It just, it's interesting to me that he chooses to make foolishness a virtue. I feel like it's more of like the innocence of ignorance where 
ignorance isn't so much as like criticizing someone because they're thinking the wrong thing, but it's more of recognizing that this person just doesn't have any knowledge of whatever it is. And we can't really be that upset about it, if that makes sense. So that's, that's definitely where I see it is the innocence of ignorance. All right. So I feel like we've already kind of covered the, where do you see Jesus within this passage? Um, it feels a little redundant to say, where do you see Jesus within this passage when this passage is about the foolishness of the message of the gospel. But um, so I kind of want to move, just move ahead and go on to that. Our fourth question, which is always um, how does this passage apply to your life? So like, as we're sitting here in Holy week, we've already celebrated Palm Sunday. We're getting ready to come into Monday, Thursday, good Friday, Easter. We know the outcome of the story. Um, and so how does this reflect within this given week, but also how does this apply to us within the current situation we find ourselves um, with the state of the world right now surrounding coronavirus? I'm going to go for it. Um, I see it a lot in, like we see the communities around us really giving back because they have nothing. But then you see like the rich and they have the funds that we could need to get through this a little bit easier, but they're not willing to give anything. Like, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg gave like two million, something million, gave some million, but it was only like 1%, if that, of his fortune. And I feel like that was a little bit more insulting than anything else. And I feel like that's kind of where this boasting is, is that they're not willing to use what is given to them, if that makes sense. Who, Aaron, calling yeah, people out. I know. I'm so you're saying like proportionally you see those with less contributing. Or like, are we going back to like the women with the two gold coins of like who gave more? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's also if like when you are like super, super, I don't know how to like prideful of like your abilities it's like the very cliche stories that you have where like the man loses everything. He was like super rich, but he loses everything because he didn't realize like what he had and wasn't thankful for the things that he had beforehand. Um, it's the same here. Like if we're not looking at like who gave us those gifts, then like what's the point of those gifts? Another way I see parallels between this and our situation is <clears throat> that first Holy Week was the most confusing time in the disciples' lives because they were welcomed in with this giant parade and then Jesus is doing these crazy things like overturning tables in the temple and teaching about his death and and then like he's killed, right? And and so it was a week of confusion and darkness and what felt a lot like foolishness, like it didn't make any sense to them. And, and I feel like, like the days right now do not make sense. Like there is a lot right now in my life that I'm like, I just don't even know how to process this. Um, and what this reminds me of is that God does his best work in those moments when you don't know how to process that when you're stuck in that moment of confusion, that's where God is most at work. Yeah, mine's along those same lines as Laura's. Um, this, I, this year, this Holy week is the most I've been able to truly put myself in the shoes of the people that were surrounding Jesus and just that the uneasiness and the questioning and the confusion and the not knowing what's coming next and the, you know, locking themselves in the room after his crucifixion because they're scared of who might be coming for them. And um, it just, I, I feel like I, I understand it in a different way now because, you know, we're locked in our houses, basically. We're, we're waiting on something that we're not quite sure what it is. Is it going to be a cure or for the virus to just go away or a vaccine? We don't, we don't know what we're waiting for. We don't know what the finish line necessarily looks like. And we're just sitting in that, that confusion and in that fear and that tension. And um, I've never felt it um, in such a palpable way as I have this year. I also think we see it in like our, our natural tendency in times of 
um, stress and panic is probably to draw like to draw inward and like in times of uncertainty, it's for us to like clamp down and like really like shorten our circle, if you will. Um, and one of the things that like Sam and I've been talking about is like, what does normal look like when we go back and like that, that kind of like period of resetting the norm where like we're, we're out and about and have the ability, like a stay at home order isn't in place anymore. We have the ability to go out and about, but like, how do we continue to treat those around us? And, <clears throat> you know, our understanding, our, our wisdom, if you would, would tell us like the, the smart thing to do is to worry about ourselves or to worry about immediately on our family. And I, I think the message of the gospel kind of flips on the, on its head. And it's like, no, what, while still being as safe as possible, what are the, what are the ways that we are called to, to care for those who, who don't have the means that we do, who don't have the support systems that we do, who don't have the resources that we do. Um, you know, I've heard stories of, of people in our, our faith community and we have, you know, volunteers who are willing to, to go and get groceries for, you know, people who are at risk of, of contracting the virus. And I think like popular wisdom would say that that's foolish. You're, you're upping your exposure. Uh, uh, you're upping the chance that you would get sick yourself. But yeah, that is, that's the foolishness of the gospel that we are called to, to, to look for those means of like self-sacrificing grace and service. Um, and so that's where, that's where I see that within our, our application for today. I like that so much more than my response. I just want to say that that's so much better than mine. <laughs> oh man. Everyone else is laughing, but their microphones are muted. And so now it just looks like I'm responding. I'll ask um, <laughs> okay. That's kind of my, that's... a common thread through all of these is somebody else will say something and I'm like, oh man. I wish I could take that's the dangers. <laughs> that's the dangers of going first because then someone else can just like sit back and be like, I'm going to add a little more grace to whatever or a little more truth to whatever someone just said. <laughs> and oh, I'm like, glad that I fed myself to the wolves. <laughs> <laughs> be brave. Go first. It's fine. Fine. All right. Our last question, last question for reflection is one that only our special guest has to answer, and that is. Who is someone that you could share this with today? Um, I mean, honestly, it's a good word for me today. Is that selfish? Is that selfish to say? So selfish. Uh, my, <laughs> my preaching professor once told me to preach the sermon that you need to hear the most. Oh, maybe there you go. I think I need to hear this today. I'm going to stop there. Okay. <laughs> I needed to hear it, so you can share it with me, Laura. There you go. <laughs> hmm. Part of that feels like a, a return to the cop out of the early days of this daily Devo when we were like, who can you share this with? All of you who we are now posting this for to watch. You're welcome. Um, but anyway, that's good enough, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll be good with it. Okay, cool. All right. Uh this week for Holy Week, um, rather than finding um, text from our prayers from Terry or uh, doing extemporaneous praying. We have, we've decided to uh, do some prayers that line up with um, the scripture and the theme that is uh, Holy Week. And so Aaron is going to close us in prayer. So we are taking this from the Revised Common Lectionary. You guys will go ahead and bow your head. Almighty God, your name is glorified. Even in the anguish of your son's death, Grant us the courage to receive your anointed servant who embodies a wisdom and love that is foolishness to the world. Empower us in witness so that all the world may recognize in the scandal of the cross, the mystery of reconciliation. Amen. 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 Thanks for having me again, y'all. Laura, oh, thank you for coming for on. Thank you here. Dropping some wisdom. Don't be foolish, man. I was dropping foolishness, Marcus. Uh, 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 <laughs> you see what I did there? You see I that? I see what you did there. I'm picking up what I you're like putting it. down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to go eat some King's Hawaiian bread. <laughs> Get it while the getting's good. Mm -hmm. All right. And we'll see you guys for another Daily Devo tomorrow.